trying to print some right now. Uh, I had one little, and I mean a small portion of this in a Brian Spirit article last month or the month before last. The name of the book is Breaking the Visual. Uh, it's got three chapters actually. And um, uh, I really, really believe this book is going to be a blessing to a lot of people. What I want to do, though, is do the same thing I did with the book, uh, the last one that I put out, and that is with it, try to raise enough money to make some more books and to be able to give out to pastors and people that want them and need them and places that we want to send the word to, um, such as Ireland. That's why the cover might appeal to the Irish people a little more. Um, so uh, the same thing goes for the last one, and that is anyone that can give toward uh, the book, uh, any any amount, of course I'd like to, not to give like a dime or, you know, <laughs> but any amount that you can give toward uh, the book would really be appreciated and it's going to be used immediately. In fact, just to be honest with you, these covers, we were only able to get them in one Kinko's and that wasn't the one in Denton, so I'm going to have to drive to get a bunch of your covers just to print up a bunch more. So, um, However, they're not even ready right now. Kay is back there printing out some, and Deb's over here folding some, and we're doing stuff. So um, if you'll catch me uh, either at break or get at break, and if you're interested, in, the main thing is if you're interested in helping out um, the ministry of the Word, getting it into the hands of people that are hungry for Jesus, uh, then jump in with whatever the Lord tells you to give. Of course, uh, more than a dime, um, and not over a hundred dollars. There's been a couple of people that was helping me. And, uh, where's Tess? Okay. A couple of people that was helping me on the editing of this. Um, and almost all of them had a really strong reaction to the book. Uh, Deb, you, you were reading I had her, I'll, a lot of times I'll write something, print it out, and give it to her first to be able to just kind of spot general things that are wrong. And she came back and was going, Can I, this, right, you want to say anything about it? Can I read it and then just say it again? Oh, that's right, that's what she said. Can, can I stop editing and just read the book? Oh, really? And then now we you have any comments on this? Yeah, it really helped to clarify the difference for me personally between what exactly are the works of the flesh and what is eyes of the seed. And it just helped me to respond in my own life and just cut off his mouth. We encouraged to rest and wait on the seed. That really, it was really clear. Cool. There's a word. Cassie, uh, since so she's not here, I'll just tell. Um, we were in prayer meeting last week, and so I brought her to her for the first time. She didn't know that I was going to flop it in her lap and say, would you just look over this and try to get it done before the end of prayer meeting? And so she went, before the end of prayer meeting, I mean, it's during prayer meeting, she's looking and checking stuff and whatever. And so she said, okay. At the end of prayer meeting, she came over and she said, this was exactly what I need. And she said, I was really freaking out over some things. And the Lord changed the direction of the way I was going with this. So anyway, I believe that the Lord did give it and there will be some things that will bless you. And, and there's a money back guarantee. If it's boring, I'll give you money back. <laughs> it's not all hype. It's just I believe that the Lord. And I said something initially that I felt that the, the little bit of it that I put in life and the spirit would really affect you. I didn't realize that the Lord was going to, in fact, it has three chapters. It had two chapters just a few days ago. Just a few days ago. And uh, the, the first chapter that was given was in the March of the Message newsletter. That was chapter three. The second one was given, chapter two was given after that. And then a few days ago, I woke up and began to write chapter one. I feel like the Star Wars trilogy. I'm <laughs> backwards. But anyway, so I think it should be a blessing to you. And if you just give me a bit of some responsible party, and I do appreciate Kay who's back there pumping out some coffees right now so they can be available if you 
desire to have. Any other comments or stuff or things like that? It's good to have uh, Mary here with us. Everybody's favorite mom. <laughs> and of course, my sister. I tell you, words cannot be said with appreciation that I have for my sister. She's just been such a blessing and just touched touched all of us in so many different ways and um, to have her here with us in our place and seeing, you know, seeing how we operate and everything, it's just a real blessing for me. I'm just so glad that, that they made the trip all the way from Japan to be with us. So, anybody else have any comments or statements? Well, then we shall get into the class. And this is a leadership class, and we've been talking about the tests. Remember the tests? No, 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 not the test at the end of the course. The real test, the test that you face in leading and helping and trying to minister to people and all the things that you will uh, come up with in that process. Uh, And uh, one of the things Ben and I were talking the other night, and, and uh, he was describing some of his situations that he'd been going through and had been noticing, not theologically, but just in himself, the difference between the soul and the spirit and, and the thing that God was doing there. And, you know, we are spirit, soul, and body. The body having the five senses. Here you, when when things come your way and touch your body, your five senses, you feel it, you hear it, you taste it, you touch it, you smell it. Um, sometimes we hear something, oh, that hurts, you know, or physically something touches us, burns, a burn or something like that, and it hurts. And so, but one of the things we begin to realize is that who we are is not our body. Our body is our travel trailer. It's not who we are, it's what we travel around with. And uh, just like you can wreck your car or something, uh, you know, you might not be able to travel as well, but you can still be okay. So, of course, uh, physically it may hurt or whatever. All right, the second area is the soul. And the soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. The mind, your will, and your emotions. And as such, uh, you have uh, certain um, choices, certain things that you prefer. That's your will. Uh, you know, you, you prefer uh, lungs. I know I do. But anyway, that's, you know, you prefer this or that. Or, you know, there's something that, that's, that's preferential to you. And you may not like somebody else's choices. Right? You may not what, like what they like, all right? <clears throat> Mentally, you've got a certain amount of training. There are certain things that you adhere to. There are certain things that you understand that other people don't understand. And that may drive you crazy that somebody doesn't, uh, you know, your ability to drive a car may be uh, expert and somebody else is an idiot. And that may bother you. In fact, the whole world may bother you. <laughs> As you drive around and go, oh, yeah, that's my way. Anyway, that's, uh, and then, of course, your emotions. And, and your emotions, and that's a huge level there and uh, a little harder to describe other than emotional reactions of happiness or, or, or anger or hurt feelings or any number of things. And so all of those relating to the, the soul. And then, of course, your spirit. And we know that something wonderful happened, and that is that Jesus didn't just save this big eggshell here. You know, Jesus didn't just come and save the big eggshell. You know, Jesus came and lives on the inside of us. Okay? He enters in. He doesn't just sit on the throne way far in heaven and say, turn left, stop that. Quit cussing. Why are you upset? There you go. No. 
He doesn't yell down commandments to us and stuff like that. He comes inside of us and He comes there to live. And in so doing, we are born again of the Spirit. And in being born again, that's different than the average person who may not be born again. Christ is your life. And the, the Bible says, He that is joined to the Lord is one Spirit. All right. Now you have people, and we're acquainted with people, that basically say, man doesn't have a spirit. Man doesn't have a spirit. He's only soul and body. When you talk about your spirit, that's Jesus. It's only Jesus. Right. Well, my basic belief is, is that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. That spirit is the Lord. It's not us. It's the Lord. It's his nature filling our spirit, and it'd be like a glass that's filled with tea. Well, it's, you know, I mean, the thing that you're enjoying is the tea. And the Lord wants to fill us to such a degree that His life, His spirit, and His nature, His nature, not our nature, not our hurts and pasts and this and that, not our physical bumps and bruises, but His nature overrides all things so that Jesus says, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, if they slap you on the cheek, what are they doing? They're affecting your body, right? Your body. Your body. They just slap your cheek. Now you can let that go deeper. And you can let that affect your soul. Amen? And then you can pull out a knife and stab them to death. I don't recommend it, but you can, you know, you can do that. That's your you have free will. Remember, that's in your soul. And your soul says, get on! All right? Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Alright? Alright. Now that can come as a commandment that comes from heaven. Turn the other cheek. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I want to kill. <laughs> and uh, so that's that's our response. As long as it's exterior to our nature, we're not going to want to do that. Or even if we want to do it, we're not going to be able to do it because it's not who we are. You understand what I mean? It's not our nature. Now remember, we're born again of the spirit and nature of Christ. So that so to turn the other cheek is an action of the nature of Christ within us. Amen? It is the nature of Christ within us. It's not your nature. Do, do I need is there somebody that doesn't really believe this that I can bring up here and demonstrate for you? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh I don't you know let me tell you. You, you get caught off guard. I mean, the example I always use is people coming into church, you know, and they're shaking hands, and everybody's meeting the greeter, and, oh, it's good to be here, everything, you know. And you, oh, praise the Lord, but I love you. And, you know, it's always hugging and carrying on. And, you know, and I think we fooled Sandy and Nate pretty good last night, you know. And, uh, you know, I think we love each other and all that stuff. But, but, you know, what if the greeter at the door, instead of hugging you, what if since you walked up, stuck out your hand, like, whack, you slapped off? What would be your first reaction? To turn the other cheek? Would it be Christ? Or would it be, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> dive on, ah, and this wrestling mask going on in the back of the church? You know what I mean? And, and that's the key is that nature is not a mental thing of the soul. Amen? Nature is not a mental thing of the soul where you go, Oh, well, let's take a little break. you got to run through your computer, run through your will and your choices, and run through your mind and why you should and shouldn't, and run through your, you know, all these different things, you know, you, uh, the, the reactions of everything, and right down to the body, and your face is all, it's all red and everything, and you're thinking all that, you know, and then you finally go, I'm going to go to the Lord, I'm going to go to the Lord, I'm going to go to the Lord. And I know people around here that have done that. That's not Jesus, they don't count. <laughs> That's you circumventing for the moment, you know. And maybe for other reasons, maybe the guy or girl that you really like is in the room at the same time. And you want them to think that you're a pretty nice person. It's amazing what you can shove down. You know, we have this monster and it's like, Rrr! don't get down, down boy. You know, not now. Okay. There'll be a day I'll loose you. I'll unleash you upon that person. Not in front of Bill. <laughs> okay. You know. And so, you know, there he is. You know, he's still there. And we but we feel good. We feel spiritual. Glory to God. I didn't do it. I overcame. You know, but the nature is still the old man. It's still the fallen nature that is in there. And so 
the purpose of God, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to not just reveal Christ, that there is a God, you know, there's this whole thing going on right now of uh, everybody's upset because uh, the, the federal court in California ruled it unconstitutional to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. <laughs> This is a federal court in California. It ruled it unconstitutional to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They told President Bush, you know, what his re reaction was? That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's the president of a federal court. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, <what's> that? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, because it says one nation under God, you know. Yeah, oh. We wouldn't want to say God. Which, you know, by the way, it makes all your money unconstitutional and God we trust, so pass it forward. <laughs> it's all unconstitutional. You can't use it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all how you look at it, isn't it? But anyway, so, um, you know, there is this thing of, of God and a reaction to God and everything. But our Lord is on the inside of us. He's not just a belief system. If it was, let me tell you something. If it wasn't for Jesus as life, there'd be no hope for me. And there'd be no hope for several of you in this room. Rob, you're one, that's right. But you know, there'd just be no hope. But it comes in as a nature, and as such, even when you fail, even when you tend to go with the old nature, you know you have a new nature. You know that you've got a You've got a, a, a whole new covenant with God based on a whole new thing, and it's not commandments, it's life. Had the law given, had, had righteousness come by the law, verily, what is it? What is it? Righteousness come by the law, verily. No, that's not right. Uh, I can look it up. We might as well get the scriptures. Galatians chapter 4. Three. Thank you very much. Verse twenty-one is the law then against. This is a uh, Galatians three twenty-one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. These commandments, these Ten Commandments, or, you know, however many, 200 and some odd precepts in the Old Testament, do not give you life. They tell you what to do, but they don't give you the strength to do it. Amen? Now, you may be able to pull off quite a few, but the Bible says if you break one, you've broken the whole law. Okay. So it catches everybody. Yeah. And you may be able to pull them off under certain circumstances, but others you won't. But Jesus fulfills the law, and so we receive not the law, but the nature that fulfills the law, which is Christ. All right, so all the tests, all the things, all of the, the, the controversies or problems that come your way, whether you're a leader or whether you're just a, a, a lamb or a, you know, a, a young sheep in the Lord, all of these things that come your way there's only one hope for it. There's not a class or a, a command. There's not a class that can teach you all the right things on how to handle everything that's going to come your way. You come here for three three years or two years and study and go out of here, and nothing can prepare you for things that I have no clue is coming your way. You know what I'm saying? So there's not enough time in the day to address every problem. But there is enough time to, to tell you that the overcoming life is Christ. The Bible calls it Christ in you, the hope of glory. The only hope. The only hope. The only hope. Christ, not in heaven. Not in heaven. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1 27. So, we've been going through the, the tests of leadership and the things that you'll face, and most of these things you will face, and they will be tough things, because we all, there is this concept of what leadership is. Oh, leadership, oh, it is just the greatest. To be in charge, to tell people what to do, to have, to have it your way. 
was at McDonald's or Burger King, you know, to have it your way. And uh, so, and which, by the way, if that's their motto, guess what? They're not having it their way. You see what I mean? I mean, you know, you think, well, okay, we're a big corporation. Well, you're not getting it your way. They're getting it their way. And people stop and yell at them and say, I wanted it my way. Huh? Has that ever happened? No. Should have worked for murder. So, these tests are going to come and things that you can't prepare for. Oh, but you can prepare for There is a way to prepare for them. And that is by conforming to the image of Christ and to take seriously every moment of every day to press in, to cry out, to say, Lord, that I may know you, not just know that there's a God, that you might, your character, your spirit, your nature may be formed in me. So that, as Paul said, it's no longer I, but Christ living in you. All right, so the last class we, well, up to this time we talked about the test of menial tasks, being put in positions of having to do things that are unspiritual. Why do I, you know, and this is funny, I, I didn't mention this, but I, when I was in Bible school, one of the things they made me do was clean toilets. And I'll never forget scrubbing a toilet and, and murmuring and grumbling in myself saying, why do they have me in here scrubbing this toilet? I should be out on the streets preaching and bringing people to Christ. And I'll never forget when the Lord finally spoke to me and said, if you can't do the simplest little task for me, you're not going to do something big for me. Is that right? Oh, no, no, no. I have to do the big, famous thing. I have to be seen and known. And, and, you know, one of the big famous things might be around here. One of the biggest famous things around here might be to do things that are not seen and known. And so we feel proud because we're doing things that are not seen and known. And when somebody brings up something, we say, I'm doing things not seen and known. Isn't that funny? <laughs> you know, now, I'm just trying to make a point here. Usually we would never go there, would we? But in this place, we have to go there. Because there's, you can you can stick pride on any animal. <laughs> you know? And we do. And I, and I have. I know what I'm not doing. You know? But it has to be genuine from the heart. It has to be Christ or we will draw something out of it. All right? Next one was the task of the mundane. And that is dry periods. You know, I mean, everybody likes spring. It's wet. It's stuff blooming. You know, da 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 on and on. Oh, we like... We like winter when it's snowing or this or that or whatever. But boy, when it hadn't rained for a while, and it's just dry and dry and dry and dry. It, you know, it is going spiritually. You can go, you know, God, have you just forsaken me? I mean, when I read the Word, I get nothing. When I pray, it seems like there's a wall between me and you. I mean, everything I do, it just, they're just, I, I just seem dry. Huh? But you know what? He's still alive, and he should be alive in us. And even if everybody is dry, you are still who he says you are, whether you feel it or not. Amen? You're not supposed to walk by feelings. Walk by faith, not by sight. Faith, well, if you got everything spelled out for you, you don't need faith. Is that right? It's only when things aren't spelled out and when things aren't clear and when things aren't exactly the way you want that you go, you know, I mean, I know people say, oh, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm a man of faith. I believe, I, I, I believe in God. I, I believe every promise in the world. I'm a man of faith, you know. Until something comes their way that they can't explain or don't understand how to deal with. And I go, oh, well, what's, the, what's with this? Well, what's with that is that's the time to exercise faith. God is a good God. God is at work in my life. He cares. You know, he may not work everything the way I want Him to work it for my benefit, but He cares and He never quits on us. Never, never, ever, 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 ever. All right.
test of, and some of your favorite, the test of worsening conditions. You know, the example I used was the demon possessed boy that was in the scripture there, and you know, the mother's going, oh, it's terrible, cast it out. So Jesus casts out the demon, and then he falls down to the ground like he's dead. She goes, now he's dead. <laughs> we went from bad to worse here. You know, and that's where you're going to have to trust the Lord, too. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I was looking at a scripture the other day, and I can't remember exactly where it's at, but I really like the way it was worded. It says, and to, he was talking to the children of Israel as they had entered into the promised land, and he said, and to remember all the way that the Lord has led thee through this wilderness. Now, let's see. Let, remember all the way that the Lord has led thee through this wilderness these four years. And I went, yeah, because we're in that wilderness for 40 years, going over here to dry times and going over here to enemy attacking and all this stuff. And he's flat out said, I led you all the way. Amen? So you don't have to go, well, did God lead me here? Is this all the devil? Is this Randy? What is this? <laughs> Somebody failed me? Somebody did get something? No, God has led you all the way through the wilderness, not just into the promised land, but all, every step of the way through the wilderness, you can be assured God is leading you. And you may not believe it, you may not act like it, but He is in charge. You know, why do we call Him Lord and then not believe that He's Lord? Is it a title? Or is it true recognition? of his position in place. Talked about the great test of responsibility. Oh, responsibility. You know, I appreciate I appreciate how the Lord does that. I um, didn't get a chance to share with Amber the other day about what the Lord shared. Did they share with you what I got? But uh, I, I'm just going to, I'm not going to say much, but I'll just use this as a little example of this. But I think for the last couple of months, the Lord's been kind of dealing with Amber and circumstances and things going on, and you know what am I, you know what's the Lord and this and that, and, and the thought of going in this direction, the thought of going in the right that direction, the thought of doing this or not doing this, and all these things coming up and everything, and I just watched her just, you know, fighting the cobwebs, you know, the big huge cob, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, trying to rake in your way, trying to find a clear path, you know. And I saw her break forth into life, you know. I saw her break forth into the Lord and go, okay, now this is the Lord. And start making decisions based on the Lord. And setting certain things in order based on the Lord's best interest, not even what she necessarily wanted. Am I right or wrong? You know. But this is the Lord, and therefore this is more important. And setting those things in order. So then later she says to me, says, well, you know, I've got, you know, I'm, just, I'm struggling with a uh, problem and stuff. And so I just, you know, I just go to the Lord. I don't know what to do. So I go to the Lord, you know. I went to the Lord. And he just assured me that she'd been laying out the path, and just putting things in order, and that everything hadn't manifest yet that she had put in order. You know, when you put a seed in the ground, uh, as soon as you put that seed in the ground, a tomato did go boom. Does it? You know, it takes time to grow. Fruit takes time. And so I believe that there's been growth and all sorts of good stuff and things for the Lord that have been put into the ground. It's a matter of time when it all comes up. What, what's, what is there to worry about if we're going for the Lord as much as we know how? You don't have to be perfect. You just have to want the Lord. You know what I mean? And if you do, then God, trust me, He makes up a whole lot for our lack. He is the fullness. All right, then we talked about the test of hirelings. And uh, we're going to jump on down now to the test of blessings. Lord Chris, I need to use your marker thing. Because I was, you know, yeah, I just not spotted it. The test of blessings. Some of you are going, I'm ready for that test. <laughs> Can you believe that? Let me just find my leg and find my hands a little bit here. Can you believe that blessing would be a test? Uh, 
I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, most of us don't think of blessings as a test. And yet blessings can be one of the hardest, one of the greatest tests, and one of the hardest ones to pass. You, uh, it, it challenges you because many of you, for example, um, if a certain, you know, a certain amount of financial funds came your way and you've never really had much money, you would be surprised at your reaction. You'd be surprised at your reaction. Somebody said to me the other day, because you know, the, the lottery was like, how many million was it? Up to? Seven million. Seven? Seven. Seven. Seventy million dollars. Somebody said to me, Randy, what would you do if you, what's the first thing you'd do if you got that? And I said, I'd tithe. <laughs> You know, but I mean, you know, because I don't, I can't think much beyond that. You know what I mean? I, I'm probably getting trouble beyond tithing. You know, well, let's see. Let me just think what I can do that is of the Lord right off of the bat. You know, and then we'll, we'll, then I'll check in with God. I, I see no need of checking in with God what I can, should do with seventy million if I ain't never gonna have it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, right now I need to be checking on other things, real things. You know what I'm saying? The blessings um, can stretch you in ways that you can't imagine. I remember, this is just one example, but I remember we had this couple that was coming to the church when we were on Bolivar and they were faithful and this seemed to be such a part of everything that was going on. And, um, and their son was not following the Lord and they were really financially strapped. They had a teenage son and he was getting into trouble and stuff and, you know, doing drugs and, well, you know, pretty much what a bunch of you do. Anyway, and he just was, a, you know, just having a hard time and they were just praying for their son and, you know, but they were really, really poor. And I mean really poor. They, they had built a home with FHA that wasn't much bigger than the office back then. Uh, it was incredibly small. Anyway, they kept coming, and we kept praying with them and being with them, and, and um, it just, it just, everything just seemed to, they just seemed to be one, at one with the body and with what the Lord was doing and saying, and all of a sudden, and I don't remember exactly how it happened, some relative died that had money or something, they came into a lot of money all of a sudden. Now, I prayed a million times for them, for finances. I mean, you know, all and just all sorts of things. The immediate response of that was they were coming to church and they went out and they bought that teenage son that was drunk, drunk and doing drugs the fastest sports car you could ever imagine. Does that make sense to you, Donnie? The fastest sports car they could ever imagine. Right. Well, what happened? Well, you know, yeah, he ended up in the hospital with cranial damage and his brain was swelling and they were going to have to cut open his you know, cranial and all this kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, first person they called was me, you know, so I show up there at the hospital at 3 in the morning and stuff like that. And I said, okay, here's what the, I prayed all the way down here. I was in the hospital in Dallas. I prayed all the way down here. Here's what the Lord told me. Tell you, from now on in this this room, only come in, he's in a coma. Come in, talk to him like he's awake, tell him you love him, read the scriptures to him, love on him, touch him, and let him know that you're there, that you care. I said his spirit is awake even if his soul and body isn't. And I said, not only that, but you need to start putting God first again. Okay, so back to church, every service involved, God worked a miracle. That kid was out of that hospital in 10 days, 10 days. They went out and bought him a new car, left the church. All right, what's, what's my point? Blessings can kill you. If you can't handle them, blessings can kill you. Alright? You know, what did David say? Lord, don't give me too much lest I get prideful and go off on my own. And don't give me too little lest I'm suffering and curse your name. 
give me what is sufficient for my needs. Anybody familiar with that scripture? Huh? It's a good one, right? You know. And so blessing, and it's not just financial blessings. There's um, God. See, you should read this book. <laughs> there's a section in here, but there's but not going into that. But you remember when when Abraham and Lot were in the land, and finally there was to be this division between Abraham and Lot. And Abraham, whom God had promised the land, said it's yours. He didn't promise it to Lot. Abraham turned to Lot and said, "Choose whatever part of the land you want. It's yours." And I'll go the opposite direction. What does the scripture say? It said Lot lifted up his eyes and he looked to the plain that was well watered and it looked with abundant, you know, with, with wildlife and all this stuff. It was the best part of the land. And he said, I want that. Now that's the carnal man. We'll do that every time if we're living from our soul or for our body. If that's what you're living for, that's what you're going to choose. But Abraham, to whom that was promised, and all of the rest of it, said, take it, it's all yours. And went off and, and turned, well, actually turned to the Lord, lifted up his eyes. This is what lifted up his eyes and saw the plain that was like Eden. Abraham then lifted up his eyes to the Lord. Where do you think, Lord? How about over here in Hebron? What's Hebron mean? Fellowship. Oh, 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 oh. See? God's not, His ways are not our ways. We're trying to pad our nest down here, and He's trying to bring us into something much, much greater that will last much, much longer. Eternal life. Amen? So, and so Abraham knows that. He knows it's not the best, it's not the worst, it's not the this or that, it is what the Lord has in mind. And so he says, Lord, what do you have in mind? And guess what happens? Lot goes down there, ends up getting wrapped up in what city? What two cities? Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, what kind of deal is that? Sodom and Gomorrah, it almost doesn't get much worse than that. Yeah, but it's the best part of the land. Well, it's the best part of the land for every other carnal thing, too. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're going to go there, too. So you're choosing just like they are, like the sodomites and anyone else. You're, oh, this is where, you know, this is where I want to be. Well, you're going to have to deal with a whole bunch of other stuff. All right? Now, what if God says to go down there and live in Sodom? Well, if God says to, then you go do it. Amen? But it's not your soul or your body saying, well, I want this. Well, I want, I got to have this. And, and I got to have it now. You know? You know why that's dangerous? Because God's not going to give you those blessings. Remember the prodigal son? He said, Father, give me, give me the goods that are due to me. And the Father said, okay. When he did, he went out and spent it all. Ended up feeding pigs for a living. You know? The Father sometimes will give you what you want. That's not always good. Huh? Children of Israel in the wilderness, God is, they're, they're in a wilderness, okay? You need to understand something. The wilderness, it's a desert. They're in a desert. There's not a, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of animals out there, and a few are scarfing off of what little insects and, you know, lizards and what, what have you that are out there, snakes and what have you. So God opens up heaven every day and sends down manna, sends down heavenly resources into the wilderness to keep them alive because they could not be sustained in the wilderness. And God's people cannot be sustained in this wilderness. We must live off of heavenly resources. Amen? You won't be sustained. You'll dry out and die in the wilderness without God's divine intervention. So he opens up the manna. So what do they do? They start griping about it. After a while, they're eating it, and they go, oh, I'm sick of this man. I don't want, you know, I don't want corned beef hash. Whatever. Lord, raise up an IHOP. <laughs> Something. 
you know, I mean, I'm just not satisfied with this, and I'm tired of this and everything. And so, so God sent them quail. And, and the Bible says he gave them what they wanted, but sent leanness into their soul. Now, I don't know the way you think, but that ought to send shivers throughout your being that you would ever, ever choose your flesh over God with the, now we're going to choose our flesh over God. I'm saying with the thought that this could lean, lean toward leanness in my soul. I mean, I would hate to live a, what always comes to my mind is in the book of Ruth, Naomi and them, they lived in Bethlehem, which means what? House of bread. House of bread. They lived in Bethlehem, the very house of bread. But a famine came. Hard times. It's not comfortable here anymore. Let's go out of the promised land and into Moab. Let's go into a foreign land and see if we can scrunch up something there. You know what I'm saying? Let's, you know. So they left. And what was the son's name? Pining and... I forget the other name. It's just this. They're just directionless. They're not in the land. They're not going God's way. They're just... They're just going the way of their body and their soul, their soul and feeding it and like animals. Like an like a, you turn a dog loose and he goes, well, you know, I want sex over here and I want food over here and you know, I want to, you know, just wandering based on that. You know, it has no nothing but its own animal instincts to lead it. So it goes from here to here to here. You so, say, you know, anybody ever lost a dog and they find it somewhere way off and go, how the heck did that dog get over there? How in the world? Well, I'll tell you, just kind of, you know, and then something went over there, and, you know, oh, you know, you know, pretty soon it woke up 180 miles away over here, you know? That, that was its life. And that's pretty much some people's life. They're just led by an instinct. Whatever comes along, and they're chasing after it, and this seems right, and this seems good. But they're pining away because deep in them there's no true direction. They're not laying hold of God's plan. And so they just pine away. They have leanness in their soul. The scripture says, and David said, you should be like a water garden. If you meditate in the word day and night, if you give yourself to it, you should be like a water garden. A water garden. You might know what I mean. I mean, you see them in magazines. They look really nice. Yeah. And, and we're talking now about life. We're not talking about feeding our flesh. We're talking about life blooming forth from us. All right. So the way that you choose in life as a leader or anybody else, the way that you choose is not based on soul and body. It's not based on instinct. It is based on what the mind of the Lord is, what God said. What did God say? What, you know, when Jesus was tempted, the devil said to Jesus, go do so-and-so. You're hungry? Make bread from these stones. You're hungry. Now, the devil is used to talking to everybody else, so he knows if he says, and Jesus has been fasting 40 days okay, without food. How many of you have gone five days without food? You know? Ten days. Fifteen. Twenty. You know, I'm telling you, some of you, when you skip a meal, you go, my oh God, I've got to eat! No! You know what's talking? Your body is talking through using your mouth. I've got to eat! No! And your soul is being carried about by your body. Your body's going, food! Food, you know, your soul and your spirit and Jesus on the inside of you. Food, food, Jesus going, I don't want to go over here. <laughs> huh? Cigarette. I gotta have a cigarette. I gotta have one now. You know? I mean I've seen people, I know people who come to church 
parents that were needing the Lord and they've been praying and God counseled with them. And finally, the very message that they needed was starting to come forth. And they're sitting there and all of a sudden an urge hit them. They had to have a cigarette and got up and walked out and went to smoke them. Came back in and said, well, how's the rest of the service? Well, it was just everything that you've been praying for for six months. But, you know, how do you feel? Oh, much better. Of course, I have no more answers than I did for the last six months. So the devil knows how to dangle stuff. You know what I mean? Do you know how they use jackasses for transportation? They'll take a stick and a rope and they'll hang a carrot out in front of them. And they just kind of keep moving that carrot and that dog is going, on, 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 on. And he's, he's got his eye on the prize. The problem is it's always just outside his reach. Huh? And he's just, you know, and so they turn that thing, and you know, let's see what we go. That's just like the devil, God knows, you know. Oh, I want him to go over here, so let's turn the carrot over here. Oh, okay, you know, and oh, okay, you know. And we think we're in control of our life. And we're not. We're being controlled by the enemy and circumstances and everything else. We have no control of our lives. We, when, when it comes to bumping up against something, we take the easy route. Like water, if we're going to just take the, the lowest route. Enemy came, Satan came to Jesus and said, You're hungry, make bread from these stones. And Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of my father. He said, I don't live by bread. What are you talking about? Because the devil never been turned down. For all men were flesh. It wasn't until after the cross that we had that same nature and life within us. So, well, what, you know, aren't you hungry? Yeah, I'm real hungry. Well, then you've got the power. You have the power to change this circumstance and bring blessing. I've already got blessing. What is it? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father is what I love all of. That's more important to you than eating? Yeah, it's more important to me than everything. No? It reminds me of Esau selling his birthright for the bowl of pottage. He was a man of flesh. He was a hunter, and he was hungry, and he came back. And that's the temptation for all of us because the Lord won't feed our flesh in some of this weakened stage because he's removed all that stuff. And then he presents us the opportunity of receiving the birthright, but we eat the bowl of pottage instead. <laughs> you know, it's because we're weak, and we want to feel that strength come back into our flesh. Right. You know, so that's we go, right. I don't need birthright, I need the bowl of punch, and we don't even realize, I mean, I know I've been, I don't know, it's what I just missed, because sure. I was so focused on feeding my flesh, that I missed the entire inheritance of my heart. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Same thing. That's good. Two of them. Well, this really goes along with the next one that I was going to share, and that's the test of character, because that's where we want to be talking about, is when the blessings come, you're being tested as to your character. Is it you, are you an upright person? Are you a true person? Or is it Christ formed in you whereby you can overcome? You know, you can, you can have a certain degree of integrity, but folks, there's an old saying, everybody has their price. I, I happen to believe that. Everybody has their price except Jesus. That's why he was not just left on a throne who comes on the inside of us as a nature. That's why the hope is a living Christ not a far away Christ or a historical Christ of 2,000 years ago or a religious Christ, a, a fig, figure and symbol. Let me tell you, a figure and symbol ain't going to hack it. You know, the living Christ is the only thing that's going to make any difference in a human life, and that is as he lives out his nature, which if you want to say it forms our character, that's fine, but the truth is, you know, like the angel said to Mary, that holy thing that is in you, Call it Jesus. <laughs> Don't call it good character. You remember? You know, call what's in you Jesus. So, let me just read this sentence and then we'll take a break. Does it seem like we already flashed through an hour already? Many veins will be put in front of you to see if you will go for them. 
the bait will be questionable as to its integrity, character, and motivation. So these are the things that says, okay, we'll go this direction, we'll go do this or whatever. Uh, it'll say, you know, somebody will come and say, Randy, there's a church up in Indiana that you would make a great pastor for. You get 50000 a year? Church vehicle? You get vacation? You get, you know, all this stuff? Well, you know, I mean, if I'm living for, for vacation, money and comfort, and, you know, um, I, I might even go, wow, let me see you. But if I know that God has me here, even if I don't like it here, <laughs> and I want to go, it has nothing to do with my will. Not my will, but that be done. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? It's still spoken by the same Jesus. He's just living in you now. Not my will, but that be done. And so there's no, in my mind, there's no, there's not even a test. There's not even a temptation. That's not even a temptation. What are you talking about? This is where God wants me. If God wants me here, then that's where I'm going to be. Amen? So, so the whole thing of overcoming tests, just like the one I just described, is not you. Because you will fail the test. It is, oh God, let me know your son. Not just far away, but let me know his life and his nature and character. Let him fill me. And let, let, let there be a genuine flow of life so that others are blessed. Not me first. Not me first. God and others. Not me first. And in doing that, you know your direction many times. It's clear to you right off the bat. Something's being dangled that says, me first. And you say, no, not me first. Now, you should pray about it because the Lord may say, yeah, not you first, but I want you to do this, but not with that motivation. You understand what I'm saying? He may say, do that. And your flesh may want that. But he's not doing it to encourage your flesh. He wants you to say, flesh, I am doing this for God, for Christ's sake in the gospel. From God and others. Even if it's what I want, I will not feed my... It's like David's men bringing in the drink offering from the well of Bethlehem. They risked their lives for it. And he said, he poured it out. He said, even I will not feed my flesh. You know, I will not feed my flesh. I live for the war. And if my men suffer and don't have something cool to drink, then I don't. We're in this to get... See, there's a bigger picture. Can you see that? There's a bigger picture. God wants to bring us into that bigger picture. All right, let's take